Thank you for joining the Anesthesia and Analgesia Ambulatory Anesthesia Webinar organized by the IARS. Next slide, please. My name is Girish Joshi. I'm a professor of anesthesiology and pain management at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. I'm an executive ed section editor for ambulatory anesthesia for anesthesia and analgesia. I'm also the past president of SAMBA, Society for Ambulatory Anesthesia, and past president of SASM, that is Society for Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine, and past president of Texas Society of Anesthesiologists. I'm the uh, editor for this themed issue, the December issue of Anesthesia and Analgesia. Ambulatory surgical care continues to expand and has become the fastest growing segment of the healthcare industry. Ambulatory surgery is associated with improved post-operative out outcomes and low healthcare costs. It allows patient-centered care with enhanced recovery in the patients comfortable at home. Overall, outpatient surgery, particularly ambulatory surgery in the ASC, helps meet triple aim of healthcare, that is patient satisfaction, population health and value. This issue of ambulatory anesthesia of ANA presents topics such as patient selection, anesthetic management, post-discharge care, and expansion of ambulatory surgery and anesthesia in low and middle income countries. It emphasizes the critical role of anesthesiologists in improving perioperative care and patient safety. We have three speakers uh, for this webinar. I'm going to start off with discussing patient selection for adult ambulatory surgery. The next speaker is Dr. Bobby Jean Schweitzer. She's the systems director and staff anesthesiologist, preoperative medicine at Innova Health, Falls Church, Virginia. She's also professor medical education, University of Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia. And she's the current president of SAMBA. She's going to present on preoperative care for cataract surgery, SAMBA position statement. After that, we have Dr. Anushka Afonso, who's the director of enhanced recovery programs at Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center in New York. She's going to present on enhanced recovery programs in an ambulatory surgical oncology center. I want to thank you again for attending. A recording of this pa and past ANA webinars will be available on the IARS YouTube channel. Next slide. After the recordings are, are over, we, we will have question answers. So please do not hesitate to put in your question answers in the Zoom task bar, uh, task bar with, with the Q&A button. Thank you. My name is Girish Joshi. I'm a professor of anesthesiology and pain management at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. I'm going to be presenting patient selection for adult ambulatory surgery based on a review article published in the December issue of Anesthesia and Analgesia. I have received honoraria from Baxter and Pasira Pharmaceuticals. My presentation does not include discussion of off-label or investigational use. Patient selection is a complex and dynamic process, and one needs to consider the type of surgical procedure, patient characteristics, proposed anesthetic technique, the type of surgical facility, and social considerations of the patient before determining appropriate patient selection. Patient characteristics 
are a major factor in determining suitability of patient for an ambulatory surgery in ASC. I'm going to present certain select controversial aspects of patient characteristics in interest of time. More details are provided in the review article. Recent data suggests that age should not be used for patient selection. In fact, older patients benefit from ambulatory surgery. Nevertheless, one needs to consider patients' comorbid conditions, presence of frailty, and cognitive status of the patient before determining suitability for ambulatory surgery. It is also necessary to consider post-discharge issues and social factors because elderly population may need extra supervision at home and there may be lack of home care support for this patient population. Another factor that needs to be considered is the ASA physical status of the patient. Although ASA physical status is considered to be subjective, it is a valid indicator of overall patient health. It is well accepted that patients with controlled stable comorbid conditions, for example, patients with ASA physical status of three or less are suitable for ambulatory surgery in a freestanding ambulatory surgery center. In contrast, patients with ASA physical status of four or more are usually not suitable for ambulatory surgery, except for certain scenarios, such as patients undergoing cataract surgery under topical anesthesia. Another controversial patient characteristic is obesity and OSA, presence of OSA. What this algorithm shows is the approach to patient selection in this patient population. Assuming that the patient's comorbid conditions are optimized, that is they have ASA physical status of three or less, we divide the patient to three separate categories. Patients with BMI of 40 or less are suitable for ambulatory surgery in an ASC. In contrast, patients with BMI of 50 or more one should proceed with caution and also consider presence of sleep apnea. For patients with BMI of 50, 40 to 50, we also need to consider presence of sleep apnea. The patients with sleep apnea can be divided into two categories. Those with known sleep apnea, that means they have a sleep study done and diagnosed of having sleep apnea and prescribed CPAP and those with presumptive diagnosis of sleep apnea. That means the diagnosis is made on tools such as the stop bank criteria. In this patient population, obviously there is no firm diagnosis and thus these patients may not have a CPAP prescribed to them. For those with known sleep apnea, if the patient is able to use CPAP after discharge, they're suitable for ambulatory surgery. If they're not able to uh, use CPAP after surgery, that patient population is then moved to the presumptive sleep apnea category. In this particular patient population, one needs to consider the need for opioid use after discharge. Patients requiring significant opioid may not be suitable for ambulatory surgery. Opioid use may be reduced by using multi appropriate multimodal anesthesia technique, particularly regional anesthesia. The SAMBA guidelines that were developed for, um, in 2013 and 12 um, basically did not provide guidance for patients with undergoing airway surgical procedure because of lack of data at that time. However, recent data suggests that patients undergoing airway surgery may be suitable for ambulatory surgery, assuming that they have a physical status 
of three or less and are not undergoing tongue-based surgical procedures. This is a recent paper where we looked at outcomes in patients undergoing airway surgery for sleep apnea. Our propensity matching showed that patients with ASA physical status of more than three and those undergoing tongue-based surgery were associated with higher 30-day readmission. Also, patients with diabetes and increased post-operative time were associated with higher complication rate. We also found that 46% of inpatients had similar characteristics as outpatients. In other words, these patients could have easily undergone the surgical procedure on an outpatient setting. So just to summarize the conclusions of this paper is that patients who are, have their comorbid conditions adequately controlled and are undergoing a procedure that is not, does not include tongue-based surgery are suitable for ambulatory surgery. With regards to patients with cardiac disease, this patient population is complex. However, patients with a recent MI, defined as MI within 30 days, patients with decompensated new onset or untreated heart failure, and those with symptomatic, uh, patients with symptomatic low ejection fraction, new onset atrial fibrillation, or severe val valvular disease are not suitable for ambulatory surgery. I do want to emphasize that we should not postpone surgery based solely on patients' blood pressure values. Though in the past, it has been suggested that patients with diastolic blood pressure of more than 110 are not suitable for elective surgical procedure. Recent data suggests that one should delay surgical procedure only if the patient has malignant hypertension. That means they have a diastolic blood pressure of more than 110 with acute end organ damage. It is recommended by AHA ACC that a cardiac risk calculator, such as this particular one, uh, which you could get on surgicalriskcalculator.com website, may be used to determine suitability for elective surgical procedure, such as ambulatory surgery. Another controversial topic is selection of patients with implantable cardioverter defibrillators. This algorithm shows an approach to selection of this patient population. First, we need to consider if EMI is likely. If EMI, EMI is not likely, we can proceed with surgery. If EMI is likely, is the procedure below the umbilicus? If the answer is yes, we may proceed with the surgical procedure. If the procedure is above the umbilicus, then we need to consider the, is the patient pacemaker dependent. If the patient is pacemaker dependent, then it is necessary to reprogram the ICD prior to surgery. If the patient is not pacemaker dependent, then we may use a magnet or reprogram before proceeding for a surgical procedure. Most importantly, in this particular patient population, it is imperative that we decrease the occurrence of EMI. And this can be done by placing grounding pad or the plate very close to the surgical site and away from the ICD. Also, our patient, our surgeons should be advised to use more monopolar diathermy as much as possible. Another patient population of controversy are patients with coronary stents. The ACCAHA guidelines suggest that delay for surgery is required if a patient's on dual antiplatelet therapy. 
which typically is for 30 days for patients with bare metal stent, six months for patients for of newer drug eluting stents, and 12 months for patients with older drug eluting stents. Overall, if the patient is not on dual antiplatelet therapy, then that patient is suitable for surgical procedure. In summary, patient selection is a complex and dynamic process. The first step in determining appropriate patient selection includes preoperative identification and optimization of comorbid conditions. More importantly, it is best to develop and implement procedure and patient specific clinical pathways. And this would improve the overall process of patient selection. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I am Bobby Jean Schweitzer, a systems director for perioperative practices at Adenova Health and professor of medical education at University of Virginia. And I'm delighted to be here to discuss the position statement from the Society for Ambulatory Anesthesia for the preoperative care for cataract surgery patients who that was published in the December issue of Anesthesia Analgesia. Um, I have a financial relationship with IARS in providing editorial services. Um, I am not going to discuss any off-label or investigational drugs in this presentation. So cataract surgery uh, is one of the most common procedures requiring anesthesia care, if not the most common. Um, cataracts we know are a very common cause of decreased vision and blindness even. And surgery remains the only really effective treatment uh, for cataracts. Uh, uh, cataracts. Uh, patients are often elderly though and with many comorbidities. However, there's really minimal risk uh, incurred with cataract surgery, primarily due to the um, minimal stress response, the no need to stop any routine medications, um, and the fact that we can often do these cases with topical or regional anesthesia and avoid even general anesthesia. Um, there has been a general consensus for more than 20 years that uh, patients do not require testing uh, before undergoing cataract procedures. And the benefits of restoring sight is enormous. Patients who, who have visual uh, impairment are at risk for falls, at risk for breaking their hips and uh, other um, bones. They're at risk for car having car accidents. They have trouble uh, taking their medications. They have trouble monitoring their blood sugar. They have trouble engaging in activities, um, especially social activities and because of the lack of, of visual acuity. So it's very important that we try to um, uh, remove any barriers of, for patients to have cataract surgery. So this guideline uh, was developed in position pa pa paper, much like previous uh, position statements from SAMBA, where we um, pose certain questions and then we try to answer those questions. Um, so in, I mentioned briefly that uh, testing is not required. Um, I also wanted to note that uh, patients should not re be required to have h &Ps or physical examinations uh, prior to cataract surgery. Um, in fact, the, the rate of consultations prior to cataract surgery has continued to increase in spite of the fact that there has been some leveling off of testing, though really not a decrease in testing. Um, but we know that there's no benefit of this. Um, and only patients with really severe medical problems that would warrant an evaluation regardless of the surgery need to be seen. And specifically, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines most recently published in 2014 indicate that cataract surgery is, is one of the only truly low risk surgeries and there, there is no need for any pre-op cardiac risk assessment or evaluation prior to cardiac surgery. Um, specifically addressing stents, this has been a bit controversial. We know that the ACCHA guidelines say that patients having recent coronary stents, that is six months uh, from drug eluting stents or one month from bare metal stents, should forego having uh, surgeries, especially if dual antiplatelet therapy needs to be interrupted. And many uh, providers have argued that this does not apply to cataract patients since we do not need to uh, interrupt dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, and there's only a minimal um, inflammatory response, and that tends to be very locally in the eye. So SAMBA has taken this, the, the position that patients who have had um, a stents can safely undergo cataract surgery within 30 days of stenting, as long as dual antiplatelet therapy is not interrupted. 
So many times we encounter patients on the day of surgery who have quote unquote newly new onset atrial fibrillation. It's really unlikely that this is really new onset. It's probably newly discovered atrial fibrillation. Many of these patients do not realize they're having palpitations or tachycardia at the time of presentation. And it's just they likely have proxismal atrial fibrillation, but now you just happen to have them in a setting where you're monitoring them and you newly discover this. Um, up to date has published a guideline um, written by electrophysiologists which state that uh, for patients who have a situation of newly discovered atrial fibrillation on the day of surgery undergoing very minor procedures typically with just simply sedation um, can be uh, proceed with that surgery and be followed up with an outpatient. So SAMBA recommends that uh, we align ourselves with that guideline and that as long as patients are asymptomatic and with stable hemodynamics they, they can proceed with their cataract surgery and then simply be followed up um, as an outpatient. So the most common cause for cancellation of, sur of, of many surgeries and the most common cause for cancellation of cataract surgery is elevated blood pressure on the day of surgery. However, we know that elevated blood pressures on the day of surgery are rarely really reflective of what the patient's normal blood pressures are. Um, and um, we know that um, there is very little evidence that elevated blood pressures, of moderate elevation of blood pressures, cause any kind of issues of increased risk with patients having surgery and definitely not increased risk of patients having cataract surgery. So SAMBA recommends that cataract surgery be only delayed for patients with malignant hypertension, which is defined as elevated blood pressures with end organ damage, typically end organs being the heart, the brain, um, or the kidneys. What about a very uh, a significantly um, advanced patient with advanced comorbidities, such as an ASA4 patient? Um, again, we believe that um, if patients um, are at higher risk, the higher their ASA physical status scores are, and the more comorbid comorbid conditions they have. However, because the risk of cataract surgery is so exceedingly low, this elevation of risk is still very, very low. And SAMA recommends that ASA4 patients with stable comorbidities who can tolerate cataract surgery with topical to regional anesthesia and no or minimal sedation can safely undergo cataract surgery. So in summary, um, we urge you to, to read this document. There are several other questions that we specifically address um, pertaining to uh, blood sugar, diabetics, um, and uh, anti patients on anticoagulants. Um, but we believe that in general, if a patient can lie in a position that allows the procedure, there are very few, if any, conditions or test results that preclude cataract surgery. So we believe the single most important question that you should ask your patients um, is can they get to the facility and lie reasonably flat with perhaps no more than one pillow underneath them for approximately 30 to 45 minutes? If that's so, we believe the patient should undergo uh, be a candidate to undergo cataract surgery um, without interrupting any of their medications and just following the routine fasting guidelines that these patients do not need any um, preoperative testing. They do not do, need a preoperative H&P or to be seen by um, any physicians, um, not their PCPs, not consultants ahead of undergoing cataract surgery um, as long as they are again stable enough to get to the facility and lie flat for 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, I look forward to answering questions. Thank you. My name is Girish Joshi. Hi, my name is Anushka Afonso. I'm over at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, I'm the Director of Enhanced Recovery Programs here. I am delighted to present our paper in the December issue of Anesthesia and Analgesia. Here are my disclosures. We'll not be talking about any off-label items or medications here. Ambulatory surgical centers are transforming healthcare. In fact, ambulatory surgery has grown in recent decades in volume and continuing to grow. As you can see in this figure, there's a shift to more procedures being performed in an ambulatory surgical center and less surgery cases performed in the inpatient setting and hospital, hospital outpatient departments. This talk will focus on Memorial Sloan Kettering's Josie Robertson Surgery Center located in New York City. This ambulatory center focuses on clinical quality and safety, patient experience, operational efficiency, innovation, and is what we will discuss continuous improvement. Our volume of patients comprised of both outpatients, which make up 65% of the volume, 
and ambulatory extended recovery patients, AXR, which makes up the remaining 35%. These are the more complex short stay ambulatory extended recovery procedures, and they're different from conventional outpatient procedures in which the patient recovers and is discharged home in a few hours. This paper describes enhanced recovery programs specifically in mastectomy, thyroidectomy, hysterectomy, and prostatectomy. Of note, there's no license in patient beds, so patients can only stay for one night postoperatively with an overall stay up to 23 hours. This publication came from our group about a year ago describing the genesis of the ambulatory center, the model, tracking, and quality improvement efforts for select patients undergoing complex procedures. Now, we are describing the actual implementation of the enhanced recovery program designed to minimize postoperative nausea and vomiting and acute postoperative pain from the same center. We are reporting perioperative data over a three-year period utilizing key components of enhanced recovery. So what are the key elements of this program? Well, first of all, patient education starts in the surgeon's office with dedicated staff instructing the patients on their pathways based on our guidelines. It's again reiterated uh, perioperatively and documented in the medical chart. We encourage liberal preoperative hydration. All patients were allowed up to 12 ounces of water two hours before arrival time. A carbohydrate loading or immunotrition drinks were not part of the ambulatory enhanced recovery. Post-op nausea vomiting risk assessed during using the ACL score. All patients received dexamethasone and odansetron as PONV prophylaxis. To minimize intraoperative opioids, we utilized multimodal analgesia at all stages, from regional blocks preoperatively to the enhanced recovery pathways, including non-opioids such as acetaminophen and ketorolac. Our approach to patient care is end-to-end -end management of these patients on pathways. From the moment the decision is made to have surgery in the surgeon's office, to pre-op eval, education, expectation settings, to management of patients in the ambulatory setting and postoperatively. We are going to focus on the anesthesia aspects, perioperative care, particularly in regards to the application of enhanced recovery pathways. We tried to standardize everything in our approach to the care of our patients. From the PONB antimatic guidelines, where the APCO score is electronically incorporated into patients' chart to guide clinical care from when they come in to when they leave, and also a standardized approach to see if these patients are fit to discharge. The important point here is that every aspect of care towards the ambulatory patient here is standardized. So these tools are utilized by both um, the surgeon, the nursing staff, everything is standardized. And these pathways and programs are developed and incorporated all these elements. And really we're focusing here on an overview of these ambulatory enhanced recoveries. So in table one, for each phase of care, there are multiple interventions that are specific to each surgical service. In fact, we have surgery specific considerations. In our mastectomy patients having immediate reconstruction, we offer them preoperative nerve blocks to reduce postoperative pain. And lorazepam postoperatively, postoperatively for chest wall tightness, which is distinct from surgical pain. For our thyroidectomies, we use smaller endotracheal tubes. We do that to minimize the risk of laryngeal edema, recurrent laryngeal nerve dysfunction, and throat discomfort. Also to reduce PONV, thyroidectomy patients receive dexamethasone 8 intraoperatively. Lidocaine 4% is sprayed down the endotracheal tube before a surgical closure to reduce the risk of coughing and bleeding on emergence. And finally, benzocaine lozenges are provided in the PACU. For our minimally invasive prostatectomies, fluid administration is restricted from surgical incision until bladder closure to facilitate visualization and minimize airway and facial edema from the steep trendelenburg positioning. After that point, fluid deficits are replenished with up to two liters of IV fluids. So we analyzed over almost close to 7,000 ambulatory surgical cases in the first three years. And you can see here almost 3,000 mastectomies, close to 2,000 prostatectomies, over 1,000 hysterectomies, and 680 thyroidectomies. So let me show you some of the trends uh, that we've seen. I'm going to focus on two of the pathways, mastectomy and thyroidectomy. 
And as reported and seen in our breast surgical population, we know that many of them are nauseated after surgery and report that they, they would rather be in a little pain than nauseous. Furthermore, PONV is a common reason that these patients are not discharged timely from the ambulatory surgery center. So over the last three years, we've increased our TV use by 28%, and as a result, our rates of PONV rescue medication that were given in the PACU decreased by 28%, consistent with this change of practice. We had a regional block program that was created with dedicated block attendings administering blocks prior to the mastectomies, and that was also optimized over the first few years. Use of non-opioids perioperatively, preemptive analgesia manifested with less narco narcotic use intraoperatively. And patients were transitioning faster from IV to oral pain medications and recovery room. Although it didn't reach significance, we did see decreased postoperative consumption in the first three, hour, three years as we were starting these ambulatory enhanced recovery programs. Compliance rates, which e with each enhanced recovery element were measured. Again, I want you to take note of this is what it looks like in real life clinical practice. It's not perfect. It's dynamic, it's changing, but it's an important point for us to look at these rates to really see if we did what we were intending in this process, to get feedback and communicate it with the team. As in the case of thyroidectomy patients, pain and PONV affected them. We increased our use of TIVA by 11% and our PONV rescue rates went decreased by 9%. And as you can see, the third graph, total intraoperative um, narcotic use is quite variable, possibly reflecting both internal and external factors. For example, we had medication shortages such as Remy fentanyl shortage in 2017. And we also changed our whole enhanced recovery protocol to include more dexmedetomidine and use of TIVA. We had more of our patients transition to oral faster, but our total post-op opioid consumption didn't change significantly. But like I said, this is real world clinical data that we have applied our enhanced recovery pathways to and adapted. So overall, over the three years, we steadily increased our use of TIVA for high-risk patients with increased compliance. As a result, our POMB rescue, especially in mastectomies and hysterectomies went down. And we used outcomes such as medication administration for PONV, as that was more concrete than nausea or transient nausea that wasn't severe enough to require medication to address it postoperatively. We are still in an opioid crisis, and even in the ambulatory surgical center, we want to be mindful of this. We reported clinical meaningful decreases in total narcotic administered intraoperatively. And our time to transition to oral analgesics from IV across all four pathways decreased as well. Patients switched from IV to oral pain meds when their level of pain can be adequately managed with oral medication, making this transition an important component of ambulatory surgery pain management and a surrogate for improved analgesia. Across all procedures, we noted that a proportion of patients ranging from 15 to 25 received no narcotics at all in the PACU. Mobility and ambulation were encouraged by our PACU nursing staff with specific instructions for patients to complete laps, as you can see here around the floor. One metric for this outcome was automated RTLS, real-time locating system, which makes it less subjective than mere observation. So using this novel technology, we quantify distances before they were discharged. In fact, this study, we report median time to ambulation about five to six hours, which has not been previously examined in the ambulatory surgical literature. Success of ambulatory surgery really depends on patient's functional recovery, and early ambulation is believed to reduce both pulmonary complications and thrombotic events, and this is especially important in our cancer patients. So attention to detail and tracking outcome really drives our process. Sometimes we change our pathway to react to data and compliance, and sometimes internal and external factors such as shortages of medication forced our hand to adapt, but this is real-life clinical setting. We want to emphasize that this is a dynamic process. Um, overall, our compliance was high, but it really varied by surgical service. Here are some quality outcomes um, separated by the different surgical services. As mentioned before, we have time to first ambulation ranging from five to six hours. Our PACU length of stay was about 20 hours, except for hysterectomy, which was about three hours less. Our reoperation rates were less than 1% with the exception of mastectomies, which was about 3.2%. Hospital transfer rates were less than 2% for all surgeries. 
our 30-day urgent care visits were low and a majority occurred greater than seven days after the procedure. So I think some of the key points are we want to demonstrate and we demonstrated the feasibility of implementing enhanced recovery for complex ambulatory cancer surgeries and we provided evolving outcomes of over 6,720 surgical cases over three years. We demonstrated continued, continued improvement resulting from increased protocol compliance as well as data-driven incremental changes to these programs. Our results established benchmarks for specific outcomes following complex procedures using enhanced recovery and can be used by other facilities as they expand their scope of service. Lastly, enhanced recovery programs should not be static by, but dynamic, and our paper is a result of this real time. It shows progress towards improving outcomes in a large cohort. We don't uh, claim that any specific intervention were responsible, but that our outcomes improved concurrently with our continually evolving enhanced recovery program. I do want to thank our whole team, especially Dr. Rebecca Trotsky, senior author, Dr. Patrick McCormick, Dr. Hanai Takeda, Dr. Vincent Ladone, and Dr. Brett Simon for really helping get this to the finish line. My contact information is at the bottom if you wish to reach me. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, I would like to open up for questions and answers, please. Um, please ask questions. Uh, so we have the first question from Ricardo. Um, for Anuska, you mentioned the opioid crisis and the enhanced recovery programs all showed a decrease in intrap opioid use, but how does this translate into when the patients go home? Do they still need narcotics? Um, that's a great question. We, we know that opioids are overprescribed after surgery, contribute to long-term abuse, misuse, abuse. Um, we actually looked at this very, very question. Um, Nikki Farron and her colleagues published this last year. We had a quality improvement initiative to try and reduce and standardize opioid prescription patterns in our complex ambulatory pathways. So what they did was they collected about um, data from about 1,000 patients, 500 before they started a opioid prescribing protocol and 500 after in hysterectomy, prostatectomy, nephrectomies, and mastectomies with and without re reconstruction. And they standardized opioid uh, prescriptions to about seven to 10 pills, depending on which service. Um, the breast service had a little bit more. And what they found that was before the opioid prescribing protocol, um, we were dispensing about 20 pills and, um, and the median consumption of across all services were about two pills. So they decreased it. And then they looked at what happened. And they looked at patient reported outcomes such as pain, um, rate of refills. And they showed that you can safely decrease the narcotics you give to the ambulatory uh, patient without an increase in reported pain or rate of refills. In fact, the refills were in the range of only four, four to seven percent. Um, the number of patients actually taking greater than 10 pills decreased by 75 percent. And so by really restricting how much you were dispensing in a thoughtful manner. Um, what I thought was really interesting is monthly, they showed um, a decrease in the median monthly opioid pills that were dispensed by over about 570 pills. That's monthly. So I, I think having a thoughtful manner in terms of a protocol on how you send these patients home with trying to figure out what their opioid consumptions are and patterns of opioid consumptions are during and after is very important as you tailor that. But it had no negative impact in terms of post-op pain management um, as evidenced by this. And this was in 2020. I'll put the reference in the chat. I'll try and find it now and put it in there. But Thank thanks you. for the question. Thank you. 
Um, I have a question for Bobby Dean. Um, one of the concerns which has been voiced to me after we published our SAMBA uh, statement, position statement is, what if the patient in a freestanding ASC who's not been tested before, no uh, uh, evaluation has been done, now suddenly requires a general anesthetic and there needs to be a conversion from topical to general anesthesia. Are the outcomes similar or should one be concerned about that possibility? So we actually addressed that question in the guideline. Um, but so I urge everybody to look at that and look at our references. There's actually a paucity of data to draw upon of the um, difference in outcomes with general anesthesia for cataract surgeries, because there have been, there's very few of those done. Um, and they just don't require general anesthesia very often. And most of the studies that were done in the literature are quite old. They're, you know, just observational, retrospective, small studies. Um, most of them showed no difference. There was one study that showed a quote unquote increased incidence of ischemia in patients who were having general anesthesia. This was diagnosed or the, the, the diagnosis of ischemia was based solely on ECG changes interoperatively. They did not measure troponins. They did not measure postoperative outcomes. And it was only interoperative ECG changes. And we know that, you know, um, nonspecific STT wave changes, and these weren't ST segment elevations, these were just nonspecific STT wave changes, um, are, you know, those are very common in patients having general anesthesia. Uh, fluid shifts, the inhalational agents we use can do that. So I don't think we can extrapolate and actually in today's um, modern definition of what ischemia is actually say that those patients had ischemia. And to extrapolate from other, you know, situations, anesthetics are actually rarely an important component of risk stratification. If you look at most of the risk stratification tools, whether that be in you know, cardiac risk stratification or other risk uh, stratification tools, it's usually the patient's comorbidity and the type of surgery the patient's having. Um, and the lower the risk of surgery, the lower the risk overall. And there's only a few specific surgeries and specific situations where the type of anesthesia actually has been shown to make a difference. Um, and that I don't believe has occurred in with cataract patients. So for that small percentage of patients who may require general anesthesia or end up you have to convert to general anesthesia, we believe the evidence is not there to support doing anything differently. Um, for patients having cataract. Again, cataract surgery overall is such exceedingly low risk um, that if there is any added risk from general anesthesia, it would also be just a very, very low risk overall anyway. You, you double the risk. Because in general, the chance of dying after cataract surgery is 0.014%. Um, so, you know, it's been estimated you're more likely to die on the day that you don't have cataract surgery than actually the day that, or the day after having cataracts. Thank you, Bobby Jean. Um, there's another question again from Ricardo. Um, uh, this is for all of us. Uh, do you have a strict criteria for patient selection for surgeries done in uh, at an ambulatory center? So I'll start with Anushka and then Bobby Jean and then I'll answer. Okay, Anushka. Um, thanks for the question. I think when we first started at Josie Robinson Center, um, we had a very strict exclusion criteria. You know, end stage renal, ASA4, all the pacemakers. And I think over time, and then over time as we looked at our own data, um, we realized we could actually do a few more, but that criteria really served as a flag. So if patients met any of those initial criteria, they would be flagged and the team would then evaluate that case on a case by case and see if that patient would um, be able to be done at that center. So I think he evolved over time, um, definitely not as strict as we were when we first opened. Um, we published on OSAs, BMIs, um, and really showed that it is feasible. It can be done safely. Thanks. Uh, Bobby Jean. 
So first of all, I'll address just the cataract uh, situation first. I, we do publish in this article a list of some conditions that we think um, likely should preclude having cataract surgery until after some time period. Um, they include you know, really very serious um, situations where patients typically have decompensated disease um, or acute unstable conditions, such as a very recent myocardial infarctions within like 30 days, um, you know, decompensated heart failure, diabetic ketoacidosis, and things like that. So, you know, if those situations, we believe that those patients, you know, should only undergo emergency surgeries, and those are typically the definitions in other literature to suggest that only emergency surgeries be done in those, you know, with those kind of conditions. But outside of that, I don't think there's any other things that preclude a patient. So even the things that maybe normally you would think about precluding patients for, such as maybe significant obesity, obesity or sleep apnea or, you know, um, uh, weight limits or something like that are not typical or difficult airways would not, not typically apply to cataract patients because these patients get such minimal sedation. And frankly, many patients don't need any sedation. I believe we frequently give sedation because we're kind of there anyway. Maybe we feel like we're not doing much. So we need to slip them a little bit of midazolam or a little bit of something else. But I think that, you know, that many of those patients really don't need anything except topical anesthesia. But as far as other patients are concerned, I think it is important that you look at your own situation in your own freestanding ambulatory center. For example, if you are able to manage patients who, you know, have difficult airways, then that should not be an issue. If you can manage patients, you know, who are very large, you have lifts or you have ways of, you know, a, a big equipment that, you know, handles these larger patients, then I think that you can safely take care of those patients. But I think that's an important, you know, thing that you, you need to look at your own situation um, and decide what is important. And I think those are the kind of things that we typically think about is, you know, such things as in-stage renal disease, um, uh, difficult airways, very large patients that you may have trouble just helping them move or that your equipment may not hold them. Um, and then those criteria perhaps are, you know, the ones you use as strictly, they can't be automatic, um, you know, bookings in your institution, but then allow surgeons to reach out to the medical director or the anesthesiologist in charge, because there's often nuances about a particular patient. And you may decide that you want to on a case by case basis override those criteria. Great, thank you. And I just want to echo both uh, Anushka and Bobby Jean's uh, answers because I cannot emphasize enough. Our review article provides some evidence with regards to uh, uh, recommendations for patient selection, and that's based on um, post-op complications, re unplanned readmission rates, and and uh, readmission rates after thirty days. However, as emphasized uh, by both Anushka and Bobby Jean, I believe that um, local circumstances should prevail. And uh, you can start slow. Um, and as the team feels comfortable, then expand on, on the approved or, or the guidelines which we or recommendations which we provide. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, I cannot emphasize enough it, the best approach, I believe, is to develop these procedure-specific uh, patient selection criteria, and then you can change them accordingly. That way, the whole team is on the same page and problems don't occur on the day of surgery and unnecessary cancellations won't occur. Um, any questions from the audience? I have a question for Anushka. Um, with, this is with regards to your pain management approach. Do you use uh, gabapentin in, in the four, four procedures you uh, described? Or is there any role for gabapentin nowadays in your practice? So um, we did change our practice, but in the ambulatory um, aspect, we use 300 milligrams of gabapentin um, with some uh, selection criteria with the elderly. Um, but in our main hospital, um, we've gotten rid of gabapentin. We used to do it post-operatively um, as part of our enhanced recovery, but after that paper that came out, 
we've changed a little bit of our practice. We're actually examining, in the midst of examining, what exact side effects are in that low dose of sedation and dizziness that we see in the ambulatory uh, patient population, if any. So we're just looking at that right now. But do you use one single pre-op dose of gabapentin? One single pre-op dose. No, you don't follow it up post-operative no. in no. ambulatory no. We don't, so prescribe, the we don't, we don't one give outpatient dose. gabapentin, no. Okay, what's the benefit of one single dose then? Well, some of our patients are getting what regional block and very uh, minimal narcotics and, um, and a little Tylenol. And so we're actually doing a little bit of a study where we're taking off some and adding on some. So we're, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know the results of that in a bit, but we're investigating that. All right, thank you. Bobby Jean, do you have any questions? Um, yes, I wondered how, you know, uh, Dr. Afonso, uh, the, the, the role of regional anesthesia in your practice um, and how you see that as in the ERAS protocols. I think that's grown tremendously. Um, we have the regional program, the block program really headed by Dr. Hanai Takita and she's really done a great job with really growing that program with uh, specified block attendings. We have preoperative blocks that are done. We're also in, in, in the midst of a big study looking which type of block would be most beneficial or combinations of block would be most beneficial in our mastectomy um, patients. And um, we've really seen as we've grown over the last uh, five years, um, kind of an evaluation of the block program and how it's really, um, it, it takes less time. Even our nurses in the PACU have reported a better, better pain score, scores and opioid reduction from our patients postoperatively from the different type. We see a difference with those who got the regional box preoperatively and those who didn't. Another thing, um, Bobby Jean, just to add, you really have to think about when in your ambulatory center, not just the blocks, but the workflow, um, the resources, the workflow, who's doing the blocks, where are the blocks gonna be done? Uh, do you have all the medications available? Uh, there's so much that comes into play with collaboration and communication. I think those are key aspects of um, incorporating the regional block program into an ambulatory center. Yeah, and even I guess the, the availability of lipid emulsions for you know, last or complications. The question for you, Dr. Joshi, do you think that if we're going to be doing patients who have OSA or at risk for OSA, that we need to have CPAP machines available in our ambulatory surgery centers for those patients who may need them in the PACU? Yes, so um, I believe that uh, all the uh, busy uh, ASCs that do OSA patients should have some form of CPAP uh, BiPAP or even high flow oxygen. One of these is enough. High flow oxygen therapy is also shown to provide some amount of CPAP as well as improve post-op oxygenation. So uh, these facilities should have some form of giving uh, supplemental uh, aid to ventilation post-operatively. Do you allow patients, do you, or you instruct patients to bring their own PAP machines? So SAMBA guidelines um, did recommend that uh, when we publish our guidelines that patients should be asked to bring the CPAP machine. The reason we did that was that patients are familiar with the CPAP machine. Um, they know the settings. Uh, it works very well for them. Uh, but not all ASCs are able to do that. It depends on, on the local uh, rules and, and and for example, our ASC the our ASC is though it's a freestanding ASC, it's affiliated to the hospital. So our hospital policies apply uh, because we have same accreditation joint commission for both the institutions, and we cannot have separate uh, policies. And and in our place, uh, patients are not allowed to bring their devices, and that's the situation where you should. Have, have some, like we need to have our own CPAP machines or BiPAP. However, there are some freestanding ASCs 
that are created by other um, uh, institutions or groups where the policies vary. And in that case, yeah, you could ask your patients to bring the CPAP machine and that way, you know, uh, use is much more easier. Nevertheless, I do want to emphasize that we need to keep in mind that the CPAP value, let's say the patient was on CPAP of 10 centimeters of water, prior surgery as a routine for the daily basis. Um, that 10 centimeters of water may not be adequate for post-operative circumstances, because now we're having a situation where um, the patient has medications on board or residual effects of inhaled anesthetics, plus there may be some amount of airway edema uh, caused by our intubation, um, and that airway edema then will dictate uh, maybe need for a higher CPAP value. So we need to keep those practical aspects in mind that just because the patient was on a certain CPAP, that CPAP may not be adequate and not hesitate in going up in the CPAP use uh, value. And um, just to add that we also encourage our patients to bring in their CPAP machine for familiarity and uh, just comfort level, especially if they're staying for that one night at the ambulatory center, but we also do have um, CPAP machines available. All right, we are coming to the close of our session. Um, if there are no further questions, I want to thank um, the speakers, uh, Bobby Jean Schweitzer and uh, Anushka Afonso uh, for their contribution. And I again want to encourage the attendees to uh, look at our themed issue, the December issue of Anesthesia Analgesia, where they will find more detailed information on the topics we have, we have presented, as well as other topics related to ambulatory anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.